ahead and get kicked off. Welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us for the 2020 annual meeting. Thank you for your patience too as we work through our, our tech, new technology for this format. My name is Monica Cody and I have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the board of CCE Madison County. We have been able to, we miss ha being able to have our annual meeting in person, but we certainly are thankful for the technology um, to still be able to gather Actually, today and myself. the accomplishments of our 2020 programming year. The work and impact of Cornell Cooperative Extension has been and is so important. And so we'll start with this brief video designed by Campus CCE team. And it's just a good reminder of the breadth and the depth that is the extension system. Can anybody hear me? Cornell University is one of the world's leading research institutions. It's also the land grant university for New York State. That means Cornell is dedicated to creating knowledge that improves the lives of New Yorkers. A vital way in which Cornell serves New York is through Cornell Cooperative Extension, a network of independent associations located across the state. Cornell Cooperative Extension translates the latest evidence-based findings generated at Cornell into practical knowledge, delivered through research-based programs and services that reach some two million New Yorkers each year. These include youth and family programs that fight childhood malnutrition, build parenting skills, and address challenges facing communities such as opioid addiction. Farm programs to spur economic development by developing pest resistant crops, creating new markets, and promoting local foods through farm to school and urban agriculture programs. Support services for military veterans and their families. Small business development programs. Environmental programs to improve water quality and protect shorelines community partnerships to revitalize cities across the state, and 4-H, a youth development program that prepares today's young people to be tomorrow's leaders. Cornell Cooperative Extension addresses local needs with its presence in every one of New York's counties, including New York City's five boroughs. Extension associations in each county are staffed by experts who live and work in their community and engage directly with residents face to face. While Cornell provides general oversight of the state's county extension offices, each of them operates as a subordinate government agency in its respective county, independent of Cornell. So by design, extension associations have the freedom and flexibility to focus on issues that matter most to local residents. Discovery and inquiry are at the heart of Cornell Cooperative Extension. Working with local partners and Cornell researchers, extension experts identify vital community issues and refine their programs to ensure maximum relevance and effectiveness. This way, knowledge and expertise flow in both directions, from Cornell to communities and vice versa. CCE also engages with a robust network of government agencies, community groups, and local volunteers. In other words, we're all in this together. For over a hundred years, Cornell Cooperative Extension has been a trusted resource for generations of New Yorkers. Its work is always evolving, but the mission remains constant, helping residents, businesses, and communities thrive. So at this time, I would like to call the meeting officially to order. It is 614. Please join with me to say the Pledge of Allegiance led by students in Ms. Hughes' third grade class in Morrisville Eaton Central School. And we'd also like you to join us in the 4-H pledge led by our 4-H edu educator, Courtney Levici. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Thank you, Courtney. 
We have an exciting program tonight that begins with some brief business items as required by our role as a subordinate government agency, and then a variety of highlights from our programming this year. We will then have the opportunity to hear from New York State Ag and Markets Commissioner Richard Ball, and we are very pleased he could join us for the program. That will be followed by our annual awards to round out the meeting. So first I'd like to give recognition to our 2020 board members. Um, I won't list everybody out, but I can tell you firsthand that this is really an amazing group of people. I'm also delighted to welcome two new board members for 2021. Greg Kuhn and Eric Haas were brought forward to the board by the 2020 nominating committee, consisting of Matt Weber, Lorna Wilson, Pete Walrod, Corey Mosier, and Johanna Bazard. The board approved the slate of new candidates and then voting occurred through Qualtrics survey sent to Madison County meeting registrants. The voting closed last night and Greg and Eric were approved unanimous, unanimously to serve uh, their first of a three-year term. In addition, Matt Weber, Lorna Wilson, and I have been approved to move forward to serve a second three-year term. I also really want to acknowledge and thank the CCE team, many of whom you will hear from tonight. And again, another amazing group of people. Of the business items to cover in the annual meeting, the minutes of last year's annual meeting have already been approved through advanced vote of Madison County meeting registrants who registered prior to 2 p.m. yesterday. The next item is approval of the association constitution, which occurs every three years. The constitution was sent to registrants yesterday for their review, noting that only the dates have been changed to recognize that it has been moved for approval for the next three years. We will now conduct a live poll to vote on a motion to accept that was, <clears throat> excuse me, offered by Alexandra Erath and seconded by Lorna Wilson from the board. Myron Thurston will be providing a poll that should appear on your screen. And as soon as you cast your vote, the poll will disappear. We will have the poll open for one full minute and then Myron will provide us with the results. So while we allow everybody a little bit more time to do that, this time we'll go ahead and move forward with our finance report. And I invite our treasurer, David Hatch, to present the association finance overview. Dave. Thanks, Monica. Through September 30th, 2020, the organization has taken in $674,000 in revenues, as you can see, just a little bit over that, from federal and state and local funding and from private grants and contributions from individuals and other grant awarding organizations. The total expenses are being closely tracked and given the current uncertain financial environment, due to the increased revenue from private grants and a reduction in our 2020 New York State and local funding, the organization is more diversified in its revenue streams than in prior previous years. However, restoring the county funding is really critically, critical, important to continued association stability. The organization is in good cash standing with just under $695,000. Total liabilities include um, a $73,000 PPP loan funding received in June. If there are any questions, please use the question and answer on your screen. Chris and I will be available to answer those. And I assume I'm not seeing any. Um, otherwise, we will move forward with a vote. A motion to accept the finance report has been made by Alexandria Erath and seconded by David Birch. At this time, Myron will provide a poll to record votes. The poll will remain for one minute as well. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And Myron, um, when you see a critical mass, can you please let us know that it has passed? And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Corinne. Um, Monica, I can report on our voting up to this point that we had unanimous consent of both the constitution and finance report barring abstentions. Thank you. So thank you, David, for that information. And uh, I'm uh, Corinne Bump, and I'm 
delighted to be here and have the opportunity to work with you through Zoom tonight. Um, I it's um, quite been quite a year here in 2020, and who knew that this was what the world would look like last year in 2019 when we held our annual association meeting. Uh, last year, I joked a little bit about um, CCE being a best friend if if we ever needed to be in the zombie apocalypse. And while we certainly haven't been in a zombie apocalypse this year, the world has certainly taken um, significant challenges and hits that called upon our CCE team to reach deep into both um, street smarts and book smarts. And, and quite frankly, I hope I never have to reference the zombie apocalypse again, uh, but it's sort of interesting that last year at this time, we were talking about the role of cooperative extension um, and being able to cover so many different components. And then here we are this year having um, been really called to action. So in all seriousness, the CCE Madison team has really embodied the connect, collaborate and engage model for true innovation, action and impact this year. You know, when COVID hit, we never stopped working. I mean, we certainly closed our doors here and then we worked at home or set up work to try to work at home during what COVID um, set us up for. But we really um, dug deep to create rapid response outreach programming for immediate response to the pandemic. And to really bring this home, I want to um, go over a few facts and figures about our work during this year. So if we go to the next slide, it's really pretty remarkable as the team looks back over the work of this year and really thinks about the amount of impact that we have had, both in terms of real dollars and just in terms of support for the economy. So despite the challenges and hardships and extremely strange working conditions this year, we were able to garner um, new grant dollars for high impact programming, as well as offer, assist, and partner in a host of programs and outreach activities to bring economic relief to the county. We also found creative ways to continue to offer critically important services, such as our free tax completion program for the elderly, which has a value of over $680,000 when you look at dollars that are returned to the seniors and the services that are provided in conducting those free programs. So we were able to figure out ways to continue to do that even when um, in, uh, in very real terms, um, it was very challenging to do. We also kept going with our youth through innovative virtual programming, ensuring they had an outlet and support and continue to develop in positive and impactful ways, even at the school at home and quarantine pandemic periods. With a total value to the county approaching over $18 million, the return on county investment to our association ranges from $15 to $38 for each dollar the county invested this year. And while this was an incredibly unique year and new programs to support the economic shock that came from COVID, we take our responsibility seriously every year to ensure we use county investment dollars to return high impact outreach and programs along with grant programs that amplify our impact and reach. And beyond the numbers, much of our work falls in that unmeasurable category or hard to really measure category. I mean, what is the value of our beautiful rural landscape? What is the value of youth accessing and experiencing positive youth development through 4-H? What is the value of quality of life that comes from our farmland and the ability to buy fresh local food from our farmers? At a time when farmland is lost at a shocking rate of 2,000 acres of land each day, what is the value of keeping our farms and farmland? There certainly is an economic value, and based on the most recent census figures, you can see that here in Madison County, that's over 113.6 million years, or $6 million a year. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's our farms, our youth, our landscape. We're incredibly proud of the work that we do here. And I'm incredibly proud and delighted to be working with the team here at CCE Madison. And much of our accomplishments this year, as you could see in those um, key points, is based on the synergy that really made us quarantine teammates this year. 
And with that, I will turn the program over to our educators to share highlights of their impactful programming. Well, hello there. My name is Craig Brown and I'm the 4-H resource educator from Madison County. And my name is Courtney Lavecchi and I am the 4-H animal science educator in Madison County. So we wanted to start um, this program off by saying that the National 4-H organization has a promise um, that they've been trying to implement by 2025. And that promise is that 4-H will reflect the population demographics, vulnerable populations, diverse needs, and social conditions of the country. And our own mission reflects that and our own programming is now going to be moving to support the diverse needs of our county. Whether that be urban, rural, in school, out of school, we're going to reflect the needs of our community by 2025. So we wanted to highlight two programs this year and uh, the first one being Cornell in the Classroom. Cornell in the Classroom uh, last year was referred to as Agriculture in the Classroom. It's been revamped, there's STEM, there's um, all kinds of new components, but it's the same hands-on research-based learning that we did last year. And as you can see from the smiles of the kids, these programs are very much um, high impact programs. On the right, if you look in the bottom, you can see all the kids on the ground. They did a biodiversity lesson where they learned that they have to, uh, well, the importance of biodiversity, because if we don't have it, everything would die. And on the left, you can see them planting and it's never too early to teach kids the benefits of having a green finger. Um, our program reached this last year 12 um, districts and it reaches 700 kids a lesson in Madison County. Our second program that we wanted to highlight this year is thinking outside the bucket. Um, I wanna do a special shout out really quick to our intern Megan Marsh, who also took a week of this programming. But what we wanted to do this year was different. We saw that kids were trapped inside their homes and they weren't able to go anywhere. There were no camps, there were no after school programs. So what we did was we went to our local community organizations, Runnings, Tractor Supply, and um, we asked them, we we're like, hey, we have this idea, we wanna bring camp to kids. And so what we did is we received 300 buckets from Runnings, about four tons of metal from Tractor Supply and a $3,000 grant from the Community New York, uh, Central New York Community Foundation, Madison County Rural Poverty Fund. Um, and using that money, we brought lessons right to kids' homes. Um, these were family-based lessons that were rockets. Um, they made birdhouses. They made all kinds of different um, programs. They planted seeds. Um, it really was based on their needs. And there was a virtual educational component that, again, was live, interactive, and engaged these kids. I think the biggest takeaway, though, with this whole program is when you're innovative and you bring these programs to kids, um, you're guaranteed to be successful. I'd like to talk now really quickly about our collaboration and commitment with Cornell Cooperative Extension SNAP Ed, and I want to introduce Whitney uh, Kmetz. Thank you so much, Craig. I just want to say that we are just so grateful for the collaboration and commitment from 4-H and Madison County to make our presence really known as SNAP Ed. Um, so as Craig mentioned, during the summer, we partnered with 4-H while they were doing the three-week bucket challenge, and we also have future collaborations, so stay tuned for this year and the next coming year. Within the buckets, each week we posed them with a secret ingredient food challenge. So they were provided with one vegetable each week. And in this, it included beets, kale, or zucchini. So with that ingredient, they had to create a recipe that was unique and with items that they had at home. So the produce was from Common Thread CSA in Madison County. SnapEd is fortunate enough to actually get a full season share through Common Thread in Madison County. Since we're a grant funded program, we are not able to purchase a share like that. So it's a great opportunity to be a part of that sponsored share program. The sponsored share is from the generosity of the local members to put forth extra funds to cover that. So we are so thankful for that. As you can see from the children in those pictures, they had a great time creating recipes. And those are just some of the great uh, recipes and faces that we saw from the children. So thank you so much for the collaboration and we really appreciate it. Stay tuned. For more information about our SNAP Ed program, please reach out to Betty Clark and I will put the information in the chat box. She is our team leader for our SNAP Ed program. And at this time I will do that. Thank you so much. 
Can we really quick, um, we can't say this enough. We would be not able to do any of the things we do without our community partners. So we just wanna say thank you. Um, we know a lot of you are here um, and every little thing that you do for us is so appreciated. Um, just to highlight one for this next year, Cornell in the classroom has grown exponentially and we just wanna do a huge shout out to Green Empire Farms who just did a $5,000 grant donation towards that program. So thank you so much. Um, I can't say it enough. I know there's more people than um, these on here. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. And next is Tess. Thank you, Craig. Um, hi, everybody. I am Tess Southern and I'm the Ag Program Educator here at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Madison County. Patty, Myron, and myself make up the Agriculture and Ag Economic Development team. Next slide. I just wanna highlight a few programs that we have focused on within the last year. Planting with Purpose is a program that bloomed out of requests for local foods due to the pandemic. As a throwback to Victory Gardens of old, we taught Madison County residents to plant gardens, maintain their health, and sustain their families. We sent out over 100 bundles of seed packets that were mailed to residents throughout Madison County. This program stretched from April through September, and we loved that the county residents were so passionate about their new gardens. A longstanding program in Madison County is um, women in agriculture. Over the last break bread, make crafts, learn how to take um, beautiful photographs of farm products and market through MailChimp. We also supported one another as our world began shifting. We had children at home, sick family members, and nearly non-existent milk checks. New York FarmNet, New York State Agricultural Mediation Program, and many others came to talk to us about coping with COVID life and how to keep moving forward. We picked each other up, applauded each other's successes, and we kept our tribe strong. Another success that came out of CCE's response to the pandemic was our informational videos, be it how to take a soil sample or slow moving vehicles, seed germination, or how to build a pallet garden. Our videos received hundreds of views on social media with lots of positive feedback from our friends of Extension, proving that we truly are the team you want on your side during tough times. Next slide. Over the last 13 years, Open Farm Day has been a staple program in Madison County. Open Farm Day brings together our farmers and consumers to educate, to bond, and to grow as a community. This year, we could not let the day slip by with no, the summer slip by with no Open Farm Day. Our team worked really hard to bring the stories of seven farms and farm businesses, which we could not have done without the farms and our sponsors. We would like to give a huge thank you to Price Chopper who donated the money to buy our equipment to make op virtual Open Farm Day a success. If you have not been able to watch the videos, please pop over to our YouTube channel after the annual meeting is over to give those a look. I'll put that in the chat box too. Next slide. Um, we were so lucky and grateful to have the opportunity to hand out personal protection equipment and COVID care packages to farmers and farm businesses throughout the county. Our care packages were delivered to over 210 farms and touched the lives of approximately 1,700 people and also caused an economic impact of over $82,000 between grants, donations, and the generosity of a lot of individuals. We would like to say a special thank you to the Central New York Community Foundation's Madison County Rural Poverty Fund, Madison County Farm Bureau, Madison County Emergency Response, the Center for Dairy Excellence, Farm Credit East, and New York State Department of Ag and Markets, plus many, many more. Next slide. We are so incredibly lucky to be part of the Central New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team. Nicole Tamal, Ashley McFarland, Dave Belbian, and the newly appointed Eric Smith, who is replacing the wonderful Kevin Gano as he steps into retirement, all play an integral part in educating Madison County on the topics of ag business, livestock, dairy, and field crops. This year, they have had regularly scheduled programs such as Dairy Day and Corn Day, as well as many livestock and farm business programs. 
They have also worked with us on PPP and CFAP training and regulations, as well as providing us and our farms with critical COVID information, updates, and outreach. A huge thank you to the team for all that you do, and thank you to Dave and Ashley for being here with us tonight. And I'm going to pass it off to Myron. Hello, everyone. Um, my, my name is Myron Thurston. I'm the Ag Economic Development and Marketing uh, Specialist at Cornell Cooperative Extension and uh, just finishing up my first year with the organization. We've had some interesting opportunities during COVID to bring revenue in a different way to farmers through uh, government programs that have come out to help our farms. One of those happens to be the Farm to Families Food Box Program. Uh, we worked with two distributors um, to try to help our region sell more into that program and that program provides free meals and free boxes of food uh, to families in need directly from farmers in our community. Um, we're, we were approved for a basic ordering agreement with Russo's Produce who works with upstate growers and packers who works with several Madison County farms uh, for the next phase of this program which will work over the next two years. The Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program uh, came out during COVID. Many of you may be aware of those programs. Many of our farmers did not think that they applied to a farmer. And so we worked with our Central New York regional team and Nicole Tamel, uh, business manager on the Capital Area regional team, Liz Higgins and I were able to get information out to several hundred farmers in New York State about the benefits of PPP and EIDL. And we did have an excess of $2 million come back to Madison County through those efforts. Another wonderful partnership that we had this year uh, and we've had for many years was with the, uh, Donna Purdy and the USDA Farm Service Agency. Our efforts of partnership together through the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program resulted in almost 200 farms applying for assistance and more than $5.5 million in support for Madison County agriculture. And that was just in round one. We are partnering to do webinars again in round two, and I'm excited to put on a webinar with our team and with Donna next week for more information on round two of CFAP. We also had some great programs that were not directly coronavirus related. One of those happens to be the SUNY Apprenticeship Program. This is a great opportunity for us. Previously, the SUNY Apprenticeship Program was only for things like building trades and electricians. And we went to them and asked, well, what about agriculture? And so CCE Madison, SUNY Morrisville, the Workforce Development Institute of New York State and the New York State Department of Labor were able to collaborate um, to institute an apprenticeship program for dairy specialists, specifically for uh, HP Hood in our area and uh, another organization out of Cayuga County that will provide $5,000 worth of free SUNY education for their new hires once they get in the apprenticeship program. Efforts are ongoing for a controlled environmental agricultural specialist, and we just are in talks right now with SUNY Cobleskill um, and Madison and Ida Boses to provide meat processing training. Meat processing is a huge need right now. We have six large plants opening up around the state, as well as many smaller ones, and these are really good paying jobs that either can be for adults that are retooling for a new environment following COVID or for students that are interested in getting more technical education. We have our Agricultural Business and Entrepreneurship Center uh, with a generous sponsorship from the Chobani Community Impact Fund through the Central New York Community Foundation. Uh, we were able to start work on a new center that should open next year. And the idea there is that we're going to provide high speed internet and technology to our farmers and give them a place to come both to learn about how to do more sales online and to market themselves online and create the content that they need in order to be able to brand themselves online. Um, we're also going to be doing a lot of other programming out of that center. We're hoping to have a grand opening in May of next year. We did a preliminary food insecurity assessment. Uh, this was an awesome program that was really spearheaded by a partnership between Madison County Rural Health and CCE. And we had an outstanding summer intern, Rachel Lines, who is from Casanova and is a rising sophomore at Northeastern University. And she did this really amazing project where she looked at where food is in the county to create a food map and then some preliminary research around the need for 
more food systems within Madison County. This is going to allow us to apply for a much larger USDA grant to get an in-depth look at our local food systems. We also started working much more closely with our farmers market managers over the last year. One of the areas that we were really able to provide information for them was around how to safely operate during COVID. This was an opportunity for us to share, uh, to give them uh, hand sanitizer to use and masks, as well as to provide the most up-to-date information from the Farmers Market Association and from New York State Ag and Markets. We instituted a new program called Curbside at Cornell. Uh, this was where we would market farmers food directly to consumers with the idea that during the beginning of COVID, there was a lack of access to food in grocery stores. And this might spur more local consumers to look to farmers in their area to make purchases. And that that uh, behavior would continue after COVID was over, or the COVID crisis had somewhat abated. And also the regional navigator program, thanks to support from Farmland for a New Generation, we were able to start connecting local realtors and non-farming landowners with farmers interested in buying or leasing property. We're also providing training to help farmers and non-farm owning landowners draw up fair and equitable lease agreements. Right now, most of these agreements are done with a handshake, which is okay, but we want to give them some other options where they can have systems in place to make sure that both sides are protected. We also had some awesome partners this year. This does not even come close to looking at the breadth of all the partners that we have, um, but SCORE and SBDC, USDA Farm Service Agency, New York Beef, all of our Madison County partners have been amazing, Farmland for a New Generation, and many of our local elected officials. We also had some awesome sponsors of different programs. Uh, including places like Chobani, the Community Foundation for South Central New York, Farm Bureau, Farm Credit East, uh, and, and many others. So we're just so appreciative that even though we may not have been able to provide programming in the way that we'd originally anticipated this year, our partners have stood by us during this trying time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Myron. Please join me in congratulating the CCE Madison team on their great work this year. At this point, I will call for a motion to close out the business portion of the meeting as we move into the next session of tonight's program. Um, please use the chat feature to offer a motion or second, and then we will call for a vote. If you are in favor um, of ending this portion and adjourning, um, then the, sorry, the business portion of the meeting, you can remain quiet on chat. And if you are opposed, please indicate so in the chat box. I see a motion to close. Thank you from Sean. And may I please get a second? Anybody's um, able to participate. Thank you, Alex. And with, uh, and then I will make a motion to vote and I'll give it 30 seconds. If anybody's opposed, please comment. And now we will move on to our next session. Um, as we queue up the video, um, I will close the business portion of the night. Thank you all. Corinne, if you could afterwards come on um, when the video is completed. I most certainly will. They ran to the groceries, they filled up their carts, they emptied the tops in Price Chopper and Walmart. They panicked and fought and then panicked some more, then they rushed to their homes and they locked all their doors. The food will be gone, the milk, eggs and cheese, the yogurt, the apples, the green beans and peas. The stores have run out, now what will we do? They'll be starving and looting and nothing to do. Then they paused and they listened a moment or two, and they heard a sound rising over the fear. It started out far, then began to grow near. But the sound wasn't sad, nor was it new. The farms were still doing what farms always do. The food was still coming, though they'd emptied the shelves. The farms kept it coming, though they'd struggled themselves. Though the cities had forgotten from where their food came, the farmers kept farming every day, just the same. Through weather and critics and markets that fall, the farms kept on farming in spite of it all. They farmed without thank yous, they farmed without praise. They farmed in the hottest and coldest of days. They'd bought all the food, yet the next day came more. 
and the people thought of something they hadn't before. Maybe food, they thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe farmers, perhaps, mean a little bit more. A poem by Anna Richards. Well, with that introduction, uh, emphasizing the importance of our farmers, uh, particularly here during our COVID times. It's my pleasure to welcome Commissioner Richard Ball to provide us with some comments tonight on the New York State agriculture through the lens of COVID-19. I can think of no one else better to uh, talk about uh, this topic with an eye on the landscape of New York State agriculture. His work takes him both from the the uh, clean white steps of the Capitol to the brown, beautiful dirt floors. He has the um, opportunity to straddle the critical connection between agriculture and policy setting and policy implementation. Tonight, in addition to hearing from the commissioner, we've set aside some time for questions and we will be using the chat feature as well as the Q&A feature for those. Please feel free to enter any questions as they occur to you and then we will collate those and share as time allows. Commissioner Ball, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to your comments. Well, thank you so much, Corinne. I, I'm uh, very impressed with your program and your ability to put a program together in these unprecedented times. And, I love that poem. I'd love to have a copy of that and uh, appreciate the thought uh, that went into that. Uh, good evening. It's really great to be with you, although virtually. Uh, I have to thank uh, Corinne for persevering on me tonight and for all of you to put this together and make it work. I uh, got a chance to listen in as you were going through your business meeting. You accomplished quite a lot and I salute you for that, for continuing to go through these unprecedented times. Um, you know, one of the questions I get quite often uh, when I'm in uh, my own county at uh, my own cooperative extension dinner is uh, what's it like to be a commissioner and do you get to talk with other commissioners? And, and the answer there is yes. Um, we talk uh, several times a week often uh, I am the vice president of the National Association of State Departments of Ag, so get to communicate a little bit more. But today, in the last three days, uh, we spent engaged in the Tri-National Accord, which is the 50 commissioners, secretaries, and directors from the United States, along with the ministers of agriculture from the provinces in Canada and the secretaries of agriculture from the 32 states in Mexico. We meet every year for three or four days, usually in person. Uh, we take turns in the host country, and this was to be the US's turn to host the Trinational Accord in Washington, DC. But again, it was a virtual meeting. But we talk about uh, implications and the implementation of trade agreements and irritants that occur between our three countries. Um, and that still went on. Uh, the work was ongoing. Uh, as you know, unprecedented times here, um, disruption to our work lives, disruption to our social lives, our personal lives, uh, and disruptions to the food supply chain, frankly, in all three countries. And it's part of the time we spent talking about COVID-19 and how we all dealt with that. And there were some lessons to be learned there. As you well know, and you've demonstrated, uh, agriculture was not postponed, it was not canceled. Uh, your work went on, it was even more critical. Your role in the ag community was vital. And I wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank you for being a part of a community that I call food responders. With all the additional roles that we took on in this challenging time, the everyday work still had to be done. And you kept doing that, and I appreciate that very much. We all do. You know, at uh, the department, we needed to make sure that we still had faith, safe food. So our food safety people, our animal and plant health people, our dairy people, uh, all of us were working seven days a week for a pretty good period of time. I felt like instead of the Department of Ag and Markets, I felt like we were the Department of Ag and Guidance. 
uh, we were asked daily uh, by the executive chamber and the governor's office to work with Department of Health and the other agencies to develop guidance for how we went forward, how we did things, uh, how we could keep things going. But I would have to say that our <clears throat> biggest focus, I think, was about food supply. We saw such a change in the food supply and such an effect on the both ends of the food supply chain. Uh, on the farm, farmers found that they woke up with 50% of their market gone. On the other end, consumers found themselves uh, trying to find food, trying to locate food on a consistent basis. Uh, it was a real challenge to keep that, figure out how to reconnect those in a different way. Um, our first concern was about processing plants, uh, keeping them working, what to do if they had a COVID positive test in their workforce, how they could not shut down, but continue to work so they could keep taking products from our farmers. Uh, it was a big challenge. I think it wasn't a food supply challenge. It was that the food was in one place and it needed to be in another place that was not known and was uh, disconnected perhaps. But working alongside of you folks, frankly, uh, between us and you, I think, uh, we distributed over a thousand face coverings to farm workers and farm people. Uh, all tens of thousands of uh, hand sanitizer, et cetera. And frankly, the information and the guidance that you helped us work on uh, that kept things going. I remember the whiplash of the first three weeks of this particularly vividly when, as you mentioned in the poem, uh, grocery store shelves were getting emptied and uh, we got questions from the governor's office about the supply and we knew we had supply. I was thinking about in particular dairy farmers. You know, I was talking to one of our larger co-ops in that first couple of weeks. The very first week after the pandemic hit us, they had to redirect over 300 trailer loads of raw milk away from going to a powder plant or a cheese plant and back to a fluid milk plant to be put into half gallons and gallons and get into the grocery store system. The second week they had to do the same thing again, not quite 300 trailer loads, but 100 trailer loads. And in the third week, they were dumping milk. It was such a whiplash and it was a whiplash to the fruit world, to the vegetable world as well. And I remember in that third week telling the governor that we were dumping milk. And he said, well, then we need to buy milk. And that was the beginning of Nourish New York. And uh, that was on a Sunday afternoon. We had a conversation, got our team together, talked with the governor's office, began to hatch out uh, a program. We identified early on with the governor's help, $25 million in emergency health food funding. We coordinated with the 10 regional food banks around the state. Uh, fortunately, we already had an excellent relationship there uh, because a couple of years ago, the governor had asked me to kind of take some of you will remember the Food Policy Council and some of you will remember a hunger and food policy, or excuse me, a hunger anti-hunger work group. And the governor said, let's put those two together and you chair it and put together the right people, put together the agencies uh, that have an impact in this area and put together the right people in the room. So Cornell's in the room, farmers are in the room, the state agencies that deal with hunger are in the room and the food banks are in the room, the pantries are in the room. And we had that hunger and food policy network relationship to build on. We reached out to all 10 regional food banks within a matter of a couple of days and put together contracts where we could get them the funding to buy New York agricultural products. I remember being on the phone with them a couple of days after we connected all the dots internally. This whole process was less than a week. And Saturday afternoon had a call with all 10 regional food banks, the Department of Health, and uh, our staff at Ag and Markets, the governor's office. Here's how the program's gonna work. 
Uh, you'll get a contract emailed to you when we hang up the phone, sign it, send it back. Sunday, Egg and Markets team will be on the phone with you figuring out how much food you need, the size of your, your neighborhood and your customer base. And on Monday, the money will be deposited into your accounts. On Tuesday, we had trucks on the road. We had dairy tra trailer loads. We had potato trailer loads. We had fruit trailer loads. Two days later, I was on Long Island distributing four trailer loads of food to over 4,000 people who were needing food. And it's been thousands of events like that have happened since that day. We've used direct distribution models. We've used voucher programs uh, that the food banks could use for their clients. And we've used direct deliveries to uh, the food banks for their own distribution networks. It's been an unqualified success. I get a report every night on what we've done to date how many pounds of milk, how many pounds of vegetables, how many pounds of fruit. And I can tell you tonight that we're at $19.8 million worth of food that New York State has helped facilitate through the food bank system. I can't say enough about the food bank system and our emergency food network and the volunteers there because it's been nothing short of amazing work. We took uh, a food uh, community that saw half of their market disappear and suddenly find another home. We saw food responders all over the state step up, volunteer, deliver food, and the work goes on. I can assure you that the lessons we've learned, the relationships that we leaned on and developed are going to go on. And I think, you know, as you uh, said, Corinne, a co you know, agriculture through the, through the lens of COVID-19. Uh, I'm thinking back to when the governor first asked me to take on this role as commissioner. And what we talked about was connecting the dots. We talked about one of the greatest agricultural communities in the country. You know, we have the best land grant system for education in the country. We have the best extension program for agriculture in the country. We have access to water. We have good land. We have some of the best farmers in the world. Uh, and we live and work and farm a few hours away from the most amazing and diverse marketplaces anywhere in the world. And he and I talked about how do we connect those dots in a better way? And that's been a big part of our mission at Ag and Markets. And to that end, I would say that if there's a silver lining in this COVID-19 pandemic. It's that New Yorkers realized uh, the importance of a food supply chain, the importance of New York State agricultural community. And I think the farmers and our producers in New York realize who their customers are and need to be, and that we need to know each other. We need to be able to rely on each other. And when we face an event like this, we need to not rely on a foreign country or another state or another transportation system or even a federal government. We need to rely on New York and make sure that we can answer the call. And I think we're showing that. So that was connecting the dots, I think, at its best. And obviously, we're not done. The work is ongoing. And uh, it's a generational opportunity, I think, that we all face. So. With that, I'll, I'll pause here and I'll just say my hat's off to Cornell Extension, in particular your county, and the work that you've done is, is yeoman's work. Uh, I'm so impressed with the level and sophistication and detail that you pay to the job you do every day. And I'm hoping that next year you'll invite me back and there's a meal involved with this because after all, it's all about the food, right? So thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, uh, we, we all look forward to being back back in the same spot. Um, so thank you for uh, such thoughtful comments on your experience and the scope and, and where we are. Um, I think we've got a couple of questions here that have come in through um, the chat box and the Q&A. And I'm going to call upon my colleagues here to um, uh, share a couple of those from the chat box and um, make sure we have a little bit of opportunity to do that before we move on to the next part of our program. 
And by the way, Commissioner, that poem was written by um, Anna Richards, uh, and we will make sure that we get you a copy of that. Thank you. Uh, we, may just, uh, we may just try to make Anna famous. <laughs> she, would, she would like that. She actually came and hand signed um, poems, that poem that we put in all of the COVID farmer care packages that we send out to our farmers. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Commissioner Ball, um, actually, this is a really relevant question. We were fortunate enough to be able to run a Nourish New York program with your office. Do you anticipate those programs will continue into 2021? Well, thank you for that. Um, I take it it was a positive experience for you. <laughs> yes, for us too, absolutely. Yeah. I haven't heard a negative word about Nourish New York and as such, I know that uh, a number of people in the legislature are pinning legislation to that effect. I want you to know that uh, uh, we are very engaged uh, with the governor's office and with the Department of Health in some very positive conversations about how we keep this going and to what degree we can keep this going. Um, I can assure you that uh, we're gonna do our best effort to do that. Um, I think there's a unified understanding of the relevance and the importance of this. So uh, I can't make an announcement right now, but I can tell you that that is our intention. Thank you so much. I have another question. What advice do you have to farmers for positioning themselves to be successful and profitable in the post COVID period? <laughs> wow, that's kind of broad. Um, you know, I think uh, the first thing I would say is to any farmer, who's your customer? Um, whether you supply a cooperative, whether you supply a farm market, a farmer's market in a town or a village, or you have a, a market on your farm, you supply the food industry, you supply schools, um, know who your customer is and know that relationship and take care of it. It's so hard to see um, when the food supply chains begin to work again. We know we're doing a pretty good job managing COVID-19 in New York State. We know we're gonna have some bumps in the road going forward as winter comes on, et cetera. So we know that as we seek to reopen the restaurant world, the food service world, the schools are doing their best to get going again but we know there'll be bumps in the road. So I think being flexible, thinking about who that customer is and are you meeting their needs? Do you need to change a little bit to adapt to their needs? Uh, we saw, you know, in the case of our food processing world, they had, they were accustomed to putting together 40 and 50 pound boxes of items that went to food service institutions, uh, but they didn't fit with the food bank system. Uh, the food bank system needed retail size products, needed products that they could dole out to families. Uh, so we needed to think about different packaging, different presentations, different weights, different everything. So I guess my first piece of advice would be uh, pay attention to your customer, find out who they are, what their needs are. Try to diversify that customer base if possible. I do think we have a tremendous opportunity here uh, because the demand on our products has been pretty amazing. The demand on potatoes, on onions, on apples, on baking goods. Uh, the demand for milk has been incredible. And if you're in the right corner of the room, uh, you've seen the benefit of that. Uh, we still had uh, a large number of producers who specialized We've seen a large number of distributors who specialized, for example, in the restaurant supply business who are still struggling and will until we can get the restaurant world back open. But I think that we've learned a few lessons here. We're gonna take us a little while to absorb it all. Um, and as we build back these supply chains, um, I think we need to be uh, cognizant of these new relationships, make sure they don't go away and that they continue to develop. Uh, but I'm, I'm very optimistic um, because I think New York stood up and answered the call pretty well. 
So some of that, some of what you're asking me, Craig, is yet to be determined. But I think fundamentally we're going to see uh, an increased demand in local, an increased demand in New York. Thank you so much. Um, I will do one more question. I I'm sorry if I don't pick yours. Uh, do you think sweeping changes are needed to the way to the way the New York food system food system is currently organized in terms of consumer access to food, supply chain logistics, farmer pay co-ops, et cetera? Or is this mostly okay, but the pandemic put pressure on the system? Well, that's a good question. I'm sure there's going to be some things and uh, we're regrouping and beginning to look at all those things pretty closely. Um, the food supply chain is, uh, is a pretty amazing beast. Um, I think generally, you know, the restaurants, if you think back, and I think back to 9-11, uh, actually, um, and I saw a high water mark there, or I saw a begin of change. I think a lot of the world was two, three, four generations removed from agriculture. I think that uh, after 9-11, a lot of people wanted to understand um, a little more about agriculture, maybe because they remembered their grandparents' world being a simpler world or a more comfortable world. And I saw a real increase in the interest in local food. Who was growing our food and how were they doing it? Um, I think restaurants played a huge role in that. Restaurants were billboards for local food. You know, 30 years ago, you went to a fancy restaurant in Manhattan and everything on the menu came from out of season and halfway around the world. And today you go into those same restaurants and uh, they're all local food and they're bragging about how close it was, and who grew it and how they had a relationship with a farmer. So, I think that's going to continue. Um, I'm optimistic about that. And I think that, you know, at one end of the food supply chain, we had farms producing food, not knowing necessarily where it was ending up. And the other end, we had consumers not necessarily knowing where the food was coming from. But next to the end of that food supply chain were the restaurateurs, were the chefs. And I think that uh, as we look forward and look at the food supply chain and how it changed and how the food bank system stepped up, how the pantries stepped up, how volunteers stepped up. I think we need to be mindful about how we utilize all the links in the chain because we're only gonna be as strong as every link. Uh, but I think I see a role there perhaps that's gonna grow. Uh, and I think that again, focusing on building back better and, and taking the lessons we've learned here uh, to do that. Thank you so, so much. Corinne, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Craig. Commissioner, again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna uh, turn it back to Monica to uh, uh, make a little transition between your comments and our next section. Thanks, Corinne. And thank you, Commissioner Ball, so much for joining us tonight and allowing us to capture your comments and to share those who are unable to join us tonight. In particular, I know that we have some FFA teachers um, in the audience that are very appreciative as they will be sharing it with their students. And I know as a farm mom, I'll be showing my children uh, tomorrow as well. So, or whenever it ends up getting posted. So I look forward to being able to do that. And thank you again. <clears throat> next thank on you our all. Program, next on our program is the special recognitions, which um, is a relatively new tradition here at CCE Madison County. We begin with a special recognition of one of our board members who will be leaving us this year after completing two full terms of service. So Corey Mosier, if you could please join me. Corey was our previous president and um, I'd like to call Tara Truitt um, out. She will be leaving us unfortunately. And um, we purchased two gifts for Tara and thanks of her appreciation, a mug and um, the hat that you see there on your screen. And assuming it's gonna be a cold winter, Tara, we know that you'll get good use out of this. Um, and Corey, I'd welcome you to uh, join me in, in saying a few words about Tara's service. Thank you so mon much, Monica, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, as, as Commissioner talked about, um, all the great people that we have and, and 
specifically today as we go through these trying times. Um, as a farmer, you know, it can be tough where you're, you're growing food and you don't know if you're really being appreciated. It seems like the margins are thinner and thinner. Um, and when I joined CCE, uh, we were um, kind of in a, in a moment of change and upheaval. Um, and there are a few conversations I remember having early on um, that I remember turned my head and, and thought, okay, wait a second. I've been a part of some boards and some, some associations. Um, there's something special going on here. Um, and Tara was one of the first. I remember sitting in a meeting when we were still joined up with Oneida County um, and some things I just didn't understand. <laughs> I remember turning to Tara and, okay, how does this work in that? What, what's going on here? Um, and, and her steadfast, um, even keeled hand um, through her um, involvement with this association um, is, is what makes farmers like me turn around and say, okay, we've got some really good people um, who are volunteering their time and they're getting her, her appreciation and focus in on 4-H. Um, it's, it's just so commendable. And she is, in order to have a successful organization or board, you need those people that are going to step up and kind of lead by example. And she was always putting her hands up, whether it be a search for new board members or um, just little help in board meetings, setting up and closing down and all that she did, Tara, all that you did to help keep us fed <laughs> for board meetings. Um, so it went from the very little to the huge, stepping up for every committee, I think, um, and chairing the 4-H committee. Um, you, you are a treasure um, and uh, CCE, um, I know I, I um, benefited from having you as a partner on the board um, and I know CCE it did as well. So thank you for your um, service and um, my heart goes out to you, thank you. And I'll echo that, Tara. Thank you for all your mentorship and everything through the, the last few years. So the next award um, on our agenda is the 2020 Friend of Extension Award. And to introduce this, we have a short video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a friend of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Madison County. Tonight, we are delighted to recognize Chobani with a Friend of Extension Award. This award is in recognition of the support of Chobani through their Community Impact Fund out of the Community Foundation Fund for Central, South Central New York and their overall support for agriculture throughout our county and our region. Chibani is truly a champion of strengthening rural communities and supporting local farmers. They are proud members of the New York State Grown and Certified Program and have launched a number of products that provide funds and support back directly to the farmers. In addition, during the coronavirus pandemic, Chibani donated time and again to food banks and local dairy drives, including the ones right here in our county, as organized through our partners and friends at Morrisville Eaton School and Morrisville State College. Here at CCE Madison County, the Chibani Community Impact Fund provided us with the opportunity to provide educational programming and mini grants directly to farmers for new and improved marketing approaches for increased sales. The program included training workshops on social media, branding, label design, storytelling, Google Analytics, and effective customer service. In addition, the Chobani Community Impact Fund has most recently provided essential support to start an agricultural support and launch center for business enhancement entrepreneurship that will be opened in 2021 at our association offices here in Morrisville. We are incredibly thankful for the support of Chobani and are delighted to recognize them with this year's Friend of Extension Award. I'm pleased to, that Mark Broadhurst, Chobani's Vice President of Public Affairs is with us tonight representing Chobani. And I would like to now introduce Mark for a few comments. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, wow, I'm, I'm really, um, really humbled. And I should be the one, we should be the one, Chobani should be the one 
thanking all of you for what you do. Um, and, and like the commissioner, um, you know, I, I was on here just a little bit early and, and saw some of your um, business meeting and it's just really incredible um, what, what you have all done. Um, and, I, and I'm probably mimicking the words of the commissioner, but I, I think the commissioner is great. By the way, I, I think he's a poet too. Not only is he a farmer and an advocate, um, he's a poet. He, he's just so good at framing things. Um, but it's amazing what you have all been able to do uh, during really um, a, a time like no other. And, and you know, we, we've all been saying that quite a bit lately, but, but really when we stop and think about it, um, it, it just, we have not experienced this. Yet the resilience, the determination, the humanity um, of people uh, all around us, especially in our state, um, that's been the reassuring part of all of this. And, and just um, a, couple of, a couple of quick words. Um, it, you know, it was, it was great listening to the commissioner um, talk about Nourish New York. Um, I remember that Sunday, I was contacted by, by his staff um, and, and I remember it was Sunday and they said, hypothetically, would you be, would Shabani be interested in this if we were to pull something like this together? And, and without even thinking about it, we, of course, we were, we were yes, we're, we're in, we're ready. Um, and, and up until that point, um, you know, uh, we had been just like many of you um, feeling the pinch of food service and, and that market evaporating almost immediately overnight. Um, but what we decided to do is um, we, we kept that portion of our business, we kept the milk flowing and we continued to produce um, fresh product, fresh yogurt. And we uh, contributed to uh, the Feeding America network um, from coast to coast. And, and during that time, uh, donated nearly 7 million cups of yogurt. Um, and, and for the dairy farmers here, I'll remind you that uh, three cups of milk for one cup of Chobani. Um, so we, we donated nearly 7 million cups uh, all across the country during that time. And then when Nurse New York came, we were, we were ready. And, and uh, my comment to the commissioner is, Whenever, whenever it comes back, whenever round two, whenever he's ready with round two, um, we want to be there as well. Particularly um, really moved by the focus and the effort um, uh, in Madison County on, on food insecurity. Um, you know, as a, as a business, uh, a, food, uh, a food producer, um, you know, this is always, uh, uh, food insecurity is always something that we've been concerned about and we've done a lot of work on. But during this pandemic, I think we all know, um, the, the, the crisis is, is much, much worse than it was. And if you talk to folks who run food banks, um, you will hear not only this tremendous increase in, in their clientele, but so many people who are using their services and coming to a food bank for the very first time. And, and we see that continuing, right? Um, so the work that you do um, as farmers, as producers, um, and, and I loved that video too, the poem, um, you know, it, it's not going to stop. Um, things may be, uh, may be a bit tough during the winter, that's what we're hearing. Um, we see that the pandemic remains, but people still need to eat. Um, and, and you will all need to do what you do and we will do what we do. And, and we all learn that we're essential. We're essential in all of this. Um, so I just really would, would much rather uh, give, give thanks to all of you um, for, for what you do as, as farmers and, and part of New York's ag community. Um, and, and thank you for this recognition, but, but really um, want to throw, throw our gratitude right back at all of you. So um, thank you. Stay safe and, and stay healthy. Thank you, Mark.
And we look forward to future partnerships and getting the center launched here as well. Absolutely. I'm sure that you'll be invited back for a tour as well. Can't wait in person. That yes, sounds like a treat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, I will introduce Craig and Courtney for our 48th Youth in Action Award. The 4-H Youth in Action Award, added in 2019, is awarded each year to a standout individual in the Madison County 4-H program. This year, the 4-H Youth in Action Award goes to Juliana Tomshow of the Morrisville Eaton Sprouting Seeds 4-H Club. Juliana has been a 4-H member for more than five years and continues to grow as a 4-H'er. She is active in the horse program with her miniature horse Jewel and new horse Comet. She is also active in the rabbit and dairy programs. Not only is Juliana a standout 4-H member, but is also a celebrated member of the Morrisville Eaton FFA in the New York State Junior Holstein Association. Each year, she puts hard work into showing and caring for her animals while participating in county and state fair. We are truly lucky to have her. Congratulations, Juliana. And Juliana, if you are on video chat, feel free to give a wave uh, and we'll recognize you from afar. But thank you again for all of the um, work that you've done. Yeah, so thank you, Juliana. Uh, when Craig and I were asked to um, give a name for this award, she was actually the first person that came to both of our minds. So it was pretty unanimous. Um, she's, you know, since I've known her and since Craig's known her, She's been an incredibly hard worker. She takes amazing care of her animals and she's involved in pretty much any everything she could be. Um, so we're really excited to present this award to her and we hope she continues to grow in 4-H until she ages out. Thank you. Our next award is, the, uh, is going to be introduced by Tess for Madison County Dairy of Distinction. Since its establishment, there have been new farms awarded with the Dairy of Distinction Award. This prestigious award, which was established in 1983, recognizes dairy owners and operators who have attractive, well-kept farms that promote a good dairy industry image. All active dairy farms in Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Vermont are eligible to apply for the Dairy of Distinction Award, and winning farms receive the special Dairy of Distinction roadside sign for the farmstead. The award, which is an incredible honor, also recognizes the hard work, dedication, and efforts of all Northeast dairy farmers. This year, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Madison County, along with the Dairy of Distinction program, is thrilled to announce their newest Dairy of Distinction recipient. Swamp Bottom Farm. Owner Brian Darrow has been shipping milk since 1999 when he took over the farm from his parents. In 2003, Brian purchased the farm, which is located in Sheds, New Woodstock, and gave the farm its current name. Together with his family, Mandy, Christopher, Christy, Cody, and Jason, Brian milks approximately 45 cows and has around 50 young stock replacements. He also raises crops for his livestock on 300 plus acres of land. The Darrow family grows crops of corn, soybeans, and hay. Congratulations to Swamp Bottom Farm for being the newest Madison County recipient of this special award. We would like to congratulate the Darrow family on their Dairy of Distinction Award. New York State Assemblyman John Selka has also provided an, an assembly citation in recognition of the Dairy of Distinction Award. Reading a bit from the citation, the New York State Assembly citation recognizes individuals who by virtue of their commitment and dedication command respect and admiration for their work. The award recognizes the Darrow family of Swamp Bottom Farm for their exemplary contributions and service as outstanding members of the agricultural community and the great state of New York. Thank you.
This year, the Centennial Farm Award goes to Westfall Dairy, LLC. Nominated by Rebecca Werbella, who co-owns and operates Werbella Farm and is an ag teacher and FFA advisor at Morrisville Eaton Middle High School, and Faye Lyon, Town of Nelson historian, Westfall Dairy, LLC was established in 1841. This farm on Judd Road in Casanova was owned first by the Hamilton family. The farm was eventually passed down to Stephen Westfall and family from grandmother Marion Hamilton Westfall and grandfather Fred Westfall Sr. Fred Sr. and his son Fred Jr. and grandson Stephen operated the farm and milked 72 cows from 1989 to 1991 when Fred Sr. passed away. The farm continued with Fred Jr. and Stephen while they transitioned to a freestall barn and acquired more cattle and more land. In 2010, Stephen and his wife Nancy officially formed Westfall Dairy LLC, where they care for 250 animals and 500 acres. Currently, the farm is run by Stephen and Nancy Westfall, along with their sons, Connor and Cody, who have expanded the family business to offer a lawn care service, Westfall Lawn Care, as well as maple syrup, Westfall Maple. Congratulations on behalf of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Madison County on being selected for the 2020 Centennial Farm Award. Thank you again to your congratulations, as I should say, to um, the West Falls um, as a Having known these folks for a long time, they are certainly very, very well deserving for a long time. And with that, um, if you could switch the next slide, please. Please join me in congratulating all of our 2020 award recipients. So just a quick shout out that um, if you can go back one slide, we were um, very delighted that um, we were able to receive uh, some special recognitions from Senator Brindisi, and I believe that um, his uh, local, let's see if she's on here. Um, no, I think she hasn't joined us, but the, her, his local um, office director has worked very hard with Myron to be able to provide these additional certificates of recognition, and we are pleased to be able to have those, and we will make sure that those get out to everyone, as well as all of the other awards that you have received tonight. Thank you, Corinne. And as we close out the annual meeting program, we want to thank all of our donors, sponsors, grantors, and volunteers. We could not do all that we do without your amazing support. We will be ending with one final short video. Feel free to watch till the end or sign off if you have other commitments. And thank you again for joining us tonight and have a good evening.
Good night, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon in 2021.